Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Beautiful. Hmm. What a lovely way to ease into our session today. Yeah, listening to Zach play, I know, uh, yeah, that's just, again, such a demonstration. Zach is, is such musical talent, and uh, it's like Jesus and the Holy Spirit plucked him from the university so he could be here with us. And, and as I go through the halls here and I look into the booth over there, I see people who had yeah, lives, careers, you know, the ways of the world, and then somehow we're just called by Jesus to to forgive and to experience the forgiven world. And as we're coming on to Christmas, it's yeah, it's so appropriate. Well, welcome everyone. I I can look up on the screen and see all your smiling faces and waves. It's a joy to be here with you again. You know, really, we just walk together hand in hand, and we're just lighting up the way for each other as we move along. It's just so touching how this inward journey needs so much nurturing and so much support, uh, just like you might just give a new, a new plant that's just pushed its way through the soil in your garden and you're just nurturing it and caring for it and loving it and letting it go through its its growth you know we are here opening our hearts and we're expanding our mind our awareness and we're opening to this uh, glorious forgiven world and really the forgiven world is really just another way of saying to be in the presence of God's love, to be in the here and now with, uh, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with that, that eternal presence that's just shining a light and, and uh, shining our, on our mind. And so a lot of times when people uh, get involved in spirituality or even religion and theologies, you know, there's so much of the do's and the don'ts and and this uh, this one's a messiah, this one's a savior, an avatar, and so on and so forth. But it's all really just pointing us to this simple present moment where we can just be still and be relaxed and feel so loved and so connected with everyone and with everything. And one of the ways we could start off is by saying that we want to we want to see with vision we want to have a different way of looking at the world and the internal teacher Jesus and the holy spirit that we're we're relying on the thing about the holy spirit is the holy spirit doesn't see the world the way that that human beings see the world and the primary difference between the way that the holy spirit sees the world and the way that human beings see the world as they're going through this awakening process is that the Holy Spirit cannot perceive error. The Holy Spirit cannot perceive a sin. The Holy Spirit looks upon a forgiven world, and that is the vision of Christ that we are opening our minds to. So, you know, we're coming close to another uh, beginning of a year, 2020, and I don't know, some of you maybe make New Year's resolutions, but uh, it may be nice to have a New Year's resolution this year. Uh, Holy Spirit, help me see no error. Just imagine how happy and joyful and peaceful your life would be if you could not have the possibility of perceiving an error. If everything was just the divine flow, no matter what anyone said, no matter what anyone did, you had no need to 
correct anybody. You had no need to fix anybody. You know, no need to change any person, place, thing, situation. Imagine a pristine state of mind that overlooks the error and only looks to the light of the atonement. And now we know why forgiveness is such an important function, because the only way to be in that experience is to be with the Spirit and to relinquish all attempts of holding on to the ego or the ego's world, the ego's way of looking at the world, which is one of fragmentation and division. So when we open up our hearts and we open up to this vision, we can truly feel the joy of all things work together for good. We can truly feel that there is no need, no lack. Everything is complete. Everything is fulfilled. Everything is total. Everything is unified. And it sounds very otherworldly, but we could say that in one sense it is. You know, when Jesus says in Lesson uh, 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want. He never leaves it there. He always rolls on to the next lesson. Beyond this world is a world I want. And he's talking about the forgiven world. He's talking about this world of complete non-judgment, where there's not even a thought of judgment. So today, I think in opening up this beautiful session on the forgiven world, I just went to, back in the day, back in the 70s, the course was actually published in three volumes. So what I'm holding in my hand is one of the three volumes. It's the, it's the workbook, workbook for students, it says. And this one is so old that one of the pages started falling out this morning when I opened to read it. <laughs> it's, it's ancient. It's from decades ago. But... Nice hardcover. You carry these things around in the 70s and you put them in your backpack and you've got a weight because this is the, the middle size one. The text was even bigger. But I thought just to open this up today, I would just open up to what I call the forgiveness lessons. If we're going to experience the forgiven world, then let us hear our beloved master. Jesus teach us about forgiveness. So I'm just going to read just a little bit uh, because it's just so delightful. But I'm going to read from Lesson 121. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. And Lesson 122, forgiveness offers everything I want. And what struck me today when I saw the lesson, when I read the title of the lesson, when I opened this book up, Forgiveness is the key to happiness. Just think about that. A key is, is for the purpose of unlocking something, right? That's why we use a key. We use a key to unlock something. And so he's saying forgiveness is the key to happiness. That must be unlocking happiness. And all of us want to be happy. It's for sure all of us want to be happy. It's just that the ego is, a, is kind of a, a tricky uh, inner teacher that's trying to teach us that our happiness comes from pursuing external goals or pursuing something in the world. And somehow if we achieve or accomplish this goal or task or pursuit in the world, that we'll be happy. But Jesus is saying, no, it's actually forgiveness is the key to happiness. The state of mind that is forgiveness is the key to happiness. If you are forgiving, as Jesus teaches forgiveness, then you are happy. There's, there's no way to forgive and be unhappy. You, you will discover, as you, as you forgive, you experience a sublime happiness, a very tranquil happiness, a serene happiness. And it's a consistent happiness. It's so consistent. It's, it's actually constant because there is no opposite to this forgiven world. This forgiven world is the purpose, it's the point of everything. So I also really jumped out at me these, the first 
three words of the lesson just jumped out at me today when I looked at it, because the first three word, the first four words are here is the answer. That's how it starts out. And I noticed as I went later on into the next lesson, he says it again. He says, here is the answer, but he puts an exclamation point. And then in the next paragraph, he says, here is the answer a third time with another exclamation point. You know, Jesus doesn't usually put a lot of exclamation points in the book, but he starts off his lesson in forgiveness with here is the answer, and then he follows it up twice more in the next lesson. So we could say that forgiveness and the forgiven world is the answer to any conceivable problem, any upset, any discouragement, any trial that you have, any difficulty, anything. It's just good to know that there's really just one answer to all of the millions and billions and trillions and gazillions of seeming problems that there's only one answer. And to me, that gets my attention. When I read this, uh, I just am like so attentive, like, okay, you know, I remember just feeling when I opened this up, the first time I read it, I just was like, felt this love wash over me and this peace. And I was just like, so humbled to think that there is one answer to this world. And that as you experience this answer, your trials and tribulations are over forever. And it's your gateway to eternal peace. He says, here is the answer to your search for peace. Here is the key to meaning in a world that seems to make no sense. Here is the way to safety in apparent dangers that appear to threaten you at every turn and bring uncertainty to all your hopes of ever finding quietness and peace. Here all questions answered. Here, the end of all uncertainty ensured at last. Then when I drop down a little bit in this first lesson, forgiveness is the key to happiness, what read my attention was he's, he said, forgiveness is acquired. That's an interesting word to put with forgiveness. Forgiveness is acquired. Just like you think, you know, you, you acquire learning in this world, just like think you may acquire a property or acquire a car. There's all kinds of things you could acquire, it would seem in this world, but he's saying forgiveness is acquired. It is not inherent in the mind. Isn't that interesting? Forgiveness is not inherent in the mind, which cannot sin. As sin is an idea you taught yourself, forgiveness must be learned by you as well, but from a teacher, capital T, other than yourself, who represents the other capital self in you. Through him, you learn how to forgive the self you think you made and let it disappear. Thus, you return your mind as one to him who is yourself and who can never sin. So, forgiveness is acquired and it is not inherent in the mind. I think that's why A Course in Miracles is really a mind training device for training your mind to acquire the experience of forgiveness. Since sin is unnatural in the mind, then the correction of sin is even is is in one sense un, unnatural, it's not inherent. So you're really going for, you might say, a present goal, not a future goal, but you're going for a present goal that has to be carefully acquired and it will seem to require some practice. So that's why it's so important to, to not, not gloss over this. You have to go into an experience, and it's not going to be merely words. It's not going to be 
the steps that will in the end be important, but it will be acquiring this state that is not inherent in the mind. It's not natural. The mind is, is so peaceful in its natural state because Christ is an idea in the mind of God. So our true identity is an idea in the mind of God. And to be the Christ is natural. Forgiveness is not inherent because the Christ is so pure, so perfect, just like God is so pure and so perfect that there is no forgiveness in heaven because in heaven there is nothing to forgive. There is no need for forgiveness in perfect oneness, perfect love, unconditional love and harmony. There's absolutely no need for forgiveness. But for a mind that has forgotten the truth, that has forgotten God, that has fallen asleep and that is dreaming a world of unreality, then forgiveness becomes the key to escaping linear time and escaping this world. So that really gives us a context for today. And then the next lesson, lesson 122, forgiveness offers everything I want. It's just like when I first read this lesson, years ago, I just was so touched by the heart of Jesus. It was like Jesus was pouring his heart out. I just felt like when I was reading it, it was like Jesus was just pouring off, pouring out this call for love and saying, this is my plea to you. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. And now I want you to see that forgiveness offers everything that I want. In other words, in this world, there are so many things to pursue and there's so many goals and, and we're taught, we're programmed actually to believe that we have to achieve and accomplish and acquire lots of things. And they may even be things like partnership and family. They may be things like degrees at, from universities or or graduating from high school. It could be uh, accumulating things. It could be building a portfolio. It could be making yourself safe and secure as the world would judge it, where you meet the lack and the cares and the concerns and the needs of the ego through the ego's methods. And then you only discover at some point you're still not satisfied, that you've You've been following the wrong path to happiness. You've been trying to reach something and looking around at others and everybody seems to be trying to reach the same thing materially and you start to realize that spiritually you're still empty. Uh, even after you've achieved and accomplished these many, many things that the ego sends you on a wild goose chase for, and and you still get the the old zero, the goose egg they call it in uh, in baseball. When you get a goose egg, you get a zero, and that's really what all the pursuits of this world and the ego amount to. They really amount to nothing. But here we go. We're coming back to the focus now. That forgiveness offers everything I want, and this is a plea right now from Jesus. The presence of Jesus is with us right now, and he's. He's making us a plea. He's, he's making us a calling. He's, he's going to use his divine logic here. He's, he says, what could you want forgiveness cannot give? Do you want peace? Forgiveness offers it. Do you want happiness? A quiet mind, a certainty of purpose, and a sense of worth and beauty that transcends the world. Do you want care and safety and the warmth of sure protection always? Do you want a quietness that cannot be disturbed, a gentleness that cannot be hurt, a deep abiding comfort and a rest so perfect it can never be upset? So he's just throwing it out to us. He's just saying, what do you want? All this forgiveness offers you, and more. It sparkles on your eyes as you awake, 
and gives you joy with which to meet the day. It soothes your forehead while you sleep and rests upon your eyelids so you see no dreams of fear and evil, malice and attack. And when you wake again, it offers you another day of happiness and peace. All this forgiveness offers you, and more. Forgiveness lets the veil be lifted that hides the face of Christ from those who look with unforgiving eyes upon the world. It lets you recognize the Son of God and clears your memory of all dead thoughts so that remembrance of your Father can arise across the threshold of your mind. What would you want forgiveness cannot give? What gifts but these are worthy to be sought? What fancied value, trivial effect, or transient promise never to be kept can hold more hope than what forgiveness brings? Why would you seek an answer other than the answer that will answer everything? Here is the perfect answer given to imperfect questions, meaningless requests, half-hearted willingness to hear, and less than halfway diligence and partial trust. And, oh my God, I missed one. There's another one. Here is the answer, he puts with an exclamation mark. Seek for it no more. You will not find another one instead. Then he comes down in the next paragraph with, again, here is the answer, exclamation. Would you stand outside while all of heaven waits for you within? Forgive and be forgiven. As you give, you will receive. Next paragraph. Here is the answer. <laughs> Again, it's the third time in uh, a few paragraphs. He's, he is, uh, he's just coming in with this over and over. Do not turn away in aimless wandering again. Accept salvation now. So when I read this, and it just, I really get emotional when I read it because it's like being offered the keys, the gateway to the kingdom of heaven. And for what has been in linear time, centuries and centuries, many, many centuries of you might say, wandering in the dark, meandering around in the dust, searching, pursuing, trying to achieve, accomplish. All of the programming says, you know, it's based on not only survival, but it wants you to thrive in the dust. If this world is really nothing but dust, uh, and we know that from the, what science has shown us, <laughs> It's, and the Course tells us it's a projection, but you can't really thrive in a projection. If the projection was made to keep you mindless, if the projection was made to keep you knowing from spirit, if the projection was made as a veil to cover over your Christ vision, if this projection was made as a distraction, and you're trying to make it in Distractionville, we'll say, that, that's like trying to pound your head on a cement wall and hoping that your skull is going to pierce the concrete. It's absolutely impossible to find lasting peace and happiness and joy in a projection that was made to keep you from that peace and happiness and joy that's within your mind. Admittedly, for all of us, you know, we came here and it's not like when we first learned to talk that our first word that came out of our mouth was mind, mind of God. You know, imagine he spoke his first words. He just, oh, I heard it, I heard it. It's usually mama, dada, you know, nana. It's something, it's, it's already a, fa it's, it's a, it's a family relationship thing that's the first word. Not mind of God. <laughs> Imagine the first word out of a child, forgiveness. <laughs> you know, oh my gosh. 
<laughs> we've got an avatar on our hand. If the first word out of the mouth is forgiveness, that's three syllables. <laughs> Not so easy as mama and dada. But the thing about it is we have so much programming, conditioning, beliefs that tells us that we're not enough and that we have to achieve, accomplish, we have to possess, we have to accumulate, we have to carve out our niche, we have to make, make our way in this world and we have to be somebody. And then we have A Course in Miracles teaching us, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. It's taking us in a whole different direction than this projection. There's so much guilt associated with the projection because it starts with this belief that you're not enough as you are right now. And somehow, if you do something and earn something and achieve something in the future, that you will be happier. And, and it's like a hamster on a wheel, you know, that's just running and running and it's going faster and faster to try to spin that wheel. And, and yet, this is the busyness of the world. And here we come towards Christmas where we're asked to, to be still. We're asked to remember that beautiful still scene in the manger with the stars above on a quiet night. We're asked to come back to the reverence. We're asked to come into the sacredness, into the, the, the deep peace and the stillness that, that is our natural state of mind. And the way to do that is we, we need to forgive. And in order to forgive, we have to empty our mind and let go of everything that we've believed we have to let go of all those thoughts. Uh, the question was coming last night in session about the private thoughts and and uh, the versus the real thoughts, where you start to realize that most of the thoughts that you think you think, even memories of things that you did or didn't do, all this guilt is wound into these private thoughts, these secret thoughts that really, they actually have no substance, they have no essence, they have no reality. They're just dead thoughts, is what Jesus called them. <laughs> he called them in the, in the workbook lesson, dead thoughts. Clearing your mind of these dead thoughts. Clearing your mind of the cobwebs. Going down through the attic, through the basement, in that old place, space, and clearing away all the cobwebs that, that block us from the joy and from the happiness. And I see for me in my life, it, I really see that this forgiven world has just been a convincing job. I, I had to be so convinced that there was nothing to pursue in this world. Because peace and contentment are no small gift. You know, as soon as you start to experience just some ex glimpse of peace, the ego seems to rush in and go, uh, well, don't lose yourself there in that peace, as if we could lose ourselves in peace. Uh, you know, you've got to handle all these other practical things. And... The Spirit is convincing us that all these things that we think are so practical, that we put so much time and energy and focus on, are actually impractical, and stillness and peace of mind, contentment, being present in the present moment, that's what's practical. It's the complete flip, it's the complete opposite of everything that we've ever believed. I just took a trip, uh, Jeffrey and I took a trip over to, uh, to Reno area in Nevada, and uh, we were going around and, and checking out some houses, and, and actually one house we went into, it was just a big welcome sign on the wall, and it had a beautiful quote of welcome and embrace, but it was a quote from Walt Disney, and then... I was like, I felt so warm, gushy and warm when I saw that quote on the wall, right on the wall. Then in a couple of the rooms, there was uh, 
the the princess from uh, Tangled that, that had to find her way back to being the princess, and then Ariel uh, from another Disney movie. And, and uh, then we took time to actually go see Frozen 2. You know, the movie just came out. Some of you saw Frozen. Now the Frozen 2 is out. And I just went in the theater and I just was washed over with these beautiful Disney colors. And it was bright, sparkly. It was just spectacular animation. Deep ideas about um, listening to your inner voice and facing the resistance and, and really going for it. And as the movie went on and on and on, it just was like, I won't give the whole plot away, but it was like discovering that everything that Elsa had believed and, and Anna had believed about their life, their family, their friends, their city, by the water, everything that they believed that was told to them by their forefathers uh, was a lie. It, it was a complete inversion of what, what was the truth. And, and to me, that was, that was a powerful message too, because this ego belief is a total lie about absolutely everything. It doesn't have a shred of truth in it. It's a death wish. It's, it's the belief that there is no love. It's the belief that there is no God. Yes, admittedly, the ego makes and fabricates its fictitious world, its fictitious romances, its fictitious love, but it's not the love of God, which changes not at all. It, it, love doesn't vary by person. Love doesn't vary by circumstance. Love is everlasting. It's eternal. It, it really cannot be squeezed down into a, a flesh cylinder or to a world of time and space. You start to realize, wow, this, this world is not my home. And then uh, I was seeing signs and symbols everywhere I went, welcome home, welcome home. But it was this inner glow, this sparkle inside, this joy, this happiness that's deep within that's, that's the actual home, and it doesn't have anything to do with anything else in the world. One of the things that, that doesn't get talked about very much, I think, with, with A Course in Miracles is that you, you have to give yourself over to a dismantling where you have to, it's like deconstructing the image that the ego made of yourself, deconstructing the world that the ego made deconstructing the ego, not by fighting against it, not by trying to, to defeat it, not by trying to uh, forcefully overcome it, but by sinking back into the meekness. Like Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's how you inherit the real world, or the happy dream, or the forgiven world. You inherit it through your meekness, through your defenselessness, through your non-reactiveness, through your quiet and silence and stillness. That's how you behold the forgiven world. You, you embrace it in your mind with the most loving care, and you, you give yourself that opportunity to do that by not pursuing and striving for anything in this world. Because whatever you strive for in this world will hurt you. Not in reality, but, but those thoughts and those beliefs will stay tucked away in the unconscious mind. And then you still will have what seems to be failures, relationships falling apart, businesses falling apart, body falling apart, world crashing and falling apart. You have all that that comes just from pursuing something outside yourself. And what I mean by that is in time and space. Instead of just sinking inward, coming deeper and deeper inward. And I know how this can sound because I remember at the beginning when I was really giving myself over to the Course, the ego was just in my mind at that point just saying, oh, come on. Oh, come on, you cannot 
think this is serious. You cannot take this course seriously. And, and to me, I was just being, I was in the tractor beam. I was being taken and lifted and carried every day as I let go more and more of what I thought was the life of David in this world. I just kept surrendering over, giving it over, trusting. Okay, show me, show me again. Show me what I need to see. Just keep, keep convincing me. I'm going to hang in with this. Just keep convincing me. Now, in this world, we, we are accustomed to learning. And, uh, and we think that learning is something that people do. We actually believe that children learn, and we believe that adults can learn, and that we actually, frankly, believe that human beings can learn. And then the deeper I got into this with Jesus, he was saying, no, those bodies are part of the projection. Those bodies don't learn at all. It's your mind has fallen asleep and it's learned this whole world. It's learned this fragmented world. And it's taught itself that bodies can learn, but he said, nothing's really going on here. And then I'd say, well, it's important to, to learn because you know you want to make better decisions. And he's like, yeah, but it's still not the bodies that are doing the learning. It's your mind listening to the guidance of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that that actually unlearns the ego. You, you unlearn, you unwind from it, and, and you unlearn the ego until you empty your mind so completely of ego thoughts and beliefs that you're, you're just back to the light, you're back to the stillness. So it's, it's very, uh, it's, it takes a lot of convincing because we're so used to personal learning and and there comes a point in the journey where you start to realize that everything that you learned personally as a human being, you were just on some kind of schizophrenic, fragmented uh, trip that was almost like a drug trip where you had no clue what you were doing. Jesus says that in the Course. You. You have learned, and you see, he says you've overlearned this world, but you never pause to ask yourself, why? Why am I so bent on learning a world of fragmentation and a world of time and space? You never really just took a breath. You never took a pause to say, now what am I doing this for again, you know? And that's why forgiveness, which is a replacement for all this crazy time and space overlearning, is more like emptying your mind and unlearning. Uh, that's what forgiveness is. It's really, I think unlearning is actually a better, a better word to describe it. It's more descriptive of, the, of um, peeling the onion of consciousness, of undoing everything that you've ever believed in. Now, right away, the ego is going to scream bloody hell. If, as soon as you you've been going forward with this learning, as soon as you put it in reverse, you can count on the ego to scream bloody hell. It, it does not like this idea of unlearning. It does not like this idea of, of stillness. It equates stillness with laziness. It equates being content in the moment with being just plain dumb, being an idiot. I mean, it, it has a whole thought system that is meant on distractions and busyness. So it's not, it's not going to be taking lightly to this desire to, to forgive. You do have to let it all go. In the end, everything about this world, you have to let go. Uh, when I was coming back from Brazil, uh, uh, Jeffrey tipped us off, uh, Slava and I off, uh, tipped us off to a movie because you get so many movies you can watch and it's, it's a nine hour plus uh, flight from Sao Paulo to, uh, to Dallas. And so one of the movies uh, that I watched was, was called Brian Banks. I never had heard of it, but I'm looking in this movie, Brian Banks, and it's about a man in Los Angeles area who who was a very talented football player. And then at some point he is falsely accused of, of sexual 
misconduct and kidnapping and all these things that he, he didn't do. He was just accused of things that he didn't do. And it takes him years and years and such a vigilance and such, he had to really believe, not only he knew his innocence, but he had to, to try to share about his innocence, to try to clear his name. And he lost, yeah, eight, nine or more years uh, of his life, his whole football career at that time, everything was wiped out. His, he, you know, even being after years and years after being uh, kind of under house arrest, a very restricted life. And this was just to clear his name for what he knew he did not do. And then I've got my friend Dale, because some of you follow along with uh, me and my friend in prison there in Chillicothe. And Dale's in prison for what he did, he seemed to do. He, he seemed to murder somebody and he was convicted. He was sent to prison and he's been, I think, in prison for maybe 16 years or a little bit more. And he's been reading my teachings, reading the course, in communication with me and some of you probably and in our uh, Jeffrey in our community and so on and so forth. So we have two movies here. One is to, to have the faith to clear your name for something you know you did not do. And then we have Dale over here to have the faith to go inside and forgive and clear your name for something that you seemed to do. That seems to be, in this world, there's a big difference between what you actually did and what you did not do. You know, that people would say, well, there's a big difference between killing somebody and not killing somebody, or, or killing, uh, having a sexual assault charge and then being innocent of that and, and not doing what you were said to have done. But that's the beauty of forgiveness is what Jesus is saying is all of your past memories are mistaken. The good memories and the bad ones. The good memories are, are but shadows of the light. And the bad memories are just very, very dark. They're just really attempts to block the light out completely. But the, the good memories are personal and the bad memories are personal. And the things that you did wrong, uh, I know that... Uh, that's what Andy was talking about last night. It was this idea that all these thoughts of what, you, even what you think you did wrong, were all body thoughts, were all time memories. And Jesus is telling us that the whole thing, the whole construct of time and space has been a descent into fear. It's a detour into fear. It's a detour into darkness. It's like you're believing something that's not real and you're feeling fear and terror and guilt from this belief in something that has no validity and no reality whatsoever. So you can see that forgiveness would apply equally to my friend Dale in prison as well as to Brian Banks. They seem to be divergent stories, but it's, it, it literally shows you, it, it's, shares like a blanket of light over the whole world. And then let's, let's pull this back and let's make this really practical. For the forgiven world is simply one realization. All you need to have is to desire one realization, and this one realization will set you and all the captives free. It's a projected world, so it's not like, you know, it's going to take millions of years for this to happen. Actually, if you can get back in the projector room and you can realize the impossibility of attack and the impossibility of projection, you're home free. You are home free into joy and happiness. There's not, nothing will touch you. Your mind is pristine and be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You have dominion over this world of images when you come back and you forgive. But here's the realization. You have to realize that there's nothing outside of your mind, that there is a trick to believe that the world is external to your mind. 
Because if the world was external to your mind, you would have no way of, of escaping it, no way of correcting it. But if, if the world is synonymous with your thoughts, and you start to realize that all of these secret private thoughts of time and space are not real and have never been real, then you can get in touch with what the workbook calls your real thoughts. What's an example of a real thought? What's an example of a thought that's in your mind right now, even if it's covered over by all these attack thoughts and judgments and time and space, a real idea is, I am as God created me. I still am as God created me. I still remain as my source created me. I was created in love. I was created in joy. It's that I amness, those I am thoughts, those beautiful, beautiful I am thoughts are still there. They haven't gone anywhere. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> what comes from God is is so true, is so real. And these layers of thoughts about time and space and your story, your goals, ambitions for the future, your memories from the past, both good and bad, it's all part of a construct that's to keep you from knowing who you are. That's the message of the matrix. The matrix was pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. That's what Morpheus is, is telling Neo. It's the world that was pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. I just met a young man in Brazil and he said, I think the key to the whole problem of this world is found in the Matrix movie. I said, exactly. That's, that's why so many people, so many young people were drawn to it. He watched that movie, he told me, when he was nine years old and now he's a grown man and he's just, he still has this message of the matrix inside of him. You know, like he, it's, it, he knows that there's something beyond this world and he's determined to find it. So as you give yourself over to this calling, you know, and, and the Course says, all are called, few choose to listen, but in the end, everyone will listen and everyone will come home. But if you're going to say yes to this calling, to escape from madness, to come back to sanity by perceiving the sanity in all your brothers and sisters, by so focusing on the good, on the real, on the true, that you, with the Holy Spirit's help and with Jesus helping you, you you reach a state where you cannot see error. You don't have to worry about how to figure out correcting the error. You reach a state that is prior to the error, prior to the so-called sin, prior to the separation. Your destiny is to go prior to this world. Before Abraham was, I am. Before time and space seemed to be, I am. Before the detour into fear, I am. You've got to really get sparked and fired up about this I amness because that's your destiny. Your destiny is not to grow old and get sick and die. That's, that is simply not your destiny at all. The world would teach you that 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 is inevitable. But I'm telling you now, I amness, love, like the Beatles said, all you need is love. The love is the destiny. It's not the body growing old and sick and dying. That, that's part of a trick. And all of us know that it just doesn't have a good feel to it. I mean, what's the, that's the meaning of life, you know, get all that you can while the getting's good, then grow old, get sick and die. You know, it's like, I, I just, like, when I was in university, I just, I was supposed to be studying for all my exams and turning in all these papers and, and getting these degrees and everything. And I, I went ahead and I, I managed to do that. But my heart really wasn't in it. I just could not believe that our destiny was to just grow old in time and get sick and die. I just, I even had other students, I remember in, in grad school, I would talk to people and they would say, David, 
get real. And I said, I am getting real. This, I, I, I'm not interested in the things of this world. I'm interested in what lasts forever. I'm interested in eternal life is what I'm interested. I'm not interested in getting, accumulating a bunch of uh, degrees or book knowledge or knowledge of the world. And, and so you have to, have to really let that spark inside, that spark for awakening grow into a flame. So my feeling is, you know, as I experience joy, as I experience the peace and the happiness, it just comes naturally from me, through me. It's all around me. It's, it's like sending out a, a beautiful light impulse, miracle impulse, in what, and it's it's so happy and content because because there's no strife in it. There's no struggle. There's there's not even an opinion in there. I mean, you know, I I always laugh. There's something inside that lasts wherever I go in the world. Where somebody comes up and they grab my arm and they pull me over and they say, "Can I get your opinion?" And I'm just like on the inside, I'm laughing like, "Good luck pulling an opinion out of there," because I don't have an opinion of anything. I can't have an opinion and be in the forgiven world. You can you notice you notice in the Bible when you read the, the New Testament, the red letters that Jesus Jesus never starts off any of his lines with, in my humble opinion. <laughs> he never you know, it's all so uncompromising, it's so vast, it's so for everyone. It's it's not just for Earth, it's for every realm in the cosmos, because the, he doesn't ever preface his his teachings by saying, uh, in my opinion, you imagine, you know, it just wouldn't be the same. In my opinion, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, it's like it just doesn't it doesn't go together, you know. But when you leave what came through on its own, that's the eternal spirit speaking. I am the way, the truth, the life. Then you can feel the presence of eternity. You can feel your destiny is right there. Behind those words is your eternal destiny. When I first started teaching the course years ago, I had people coming to me and we would talk and we would spend a lot of time together and they would... They would tell me if just my, if David, if my circumstances were just a little different, uh, I would really go for this. And I'm like, circumstances? What kind of truth is held back by circumstances? You can't be limited by circumstances. That's talk about projection. That's like taking this little error, which is what the ego is, it's this tiny mad idea, and it's taking this error and it's projecting out a world of circumstances, and then the mind becomes so accustomed to these circumstances, whatever they are, that it starts to use the circumstances as, as excuses or justifications for not awakening. It's like, it, it just didn't make any sense to me. I, I said, if it be the truth for one, it has to be the truth for all. It can't mean that there's some a truth that blesses some, and then, oh, for those over there that have difficult circumstances, well, the truth has to, oh, no, I can't deal with that. Those are too difficult of circumstances. It's like what Greg was saying toward the end there. When you go for this, when you go for your destiny, when you go for your joy, when you go for your happiness, everything will tilt toward you. This whole hypothetical world, this whole world of, of imagination will suddenly start to line up with your mind. Because why? Because you decided to wake up. You decided enough. Enough with this guilt. Enough with this fear. Enough with this worry. I've had enough of concern. I've had enough with conflict. I am not going to be conflicted anymore. I'm going to give my mind over to this awakening and let the spirit reconfigure, show me the symbols I need, bring me whoever I need to meet, 
whatever book I need to read, whatever place I need to visit. It's, it's fantastic leading a life where you don't have future goals because then you're so wide open. Imagine if you really were so trusting and so content in the moment that you were that open-minded that you could just be in that place of receptivity to accept an invitation. And there are many, many invitations that come once you decide to, to forgive. It's like the parting of the Red Sea. It's like, it's like difficulties melt away. Issues that you had before dissolve away. It's like you're, you're dreaming the dream and you're beholding the dream, but you don't see a problem with the dream. You don't really see a problem. Before you wake up from the dream, you must get to a point where you see there are no problems with the dream. That's what a happy dream is. It doesn't have any problems. You have to come to the place of happiness before you wake up to eternal happiness. You don't, you don't get to heaven by dying. You get to heaven by forgiving. And what I mean by that is by just beholding the, the happy dream. So, ah, this is so, this topic is so touching to me. This is so deep. This is so relevant. And I cannot think of a more relevant topic or something that you want to give your full attention to than, than forgiveness. Because forgiveness practiced without exceptions yields the forgiven world. You, you, you can't really avoid the forgiven world because it's, it's, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is a gift that, that you, you must accept in the end because it's, it's your destiny. You can, you can seem to run or hide or avoid or evade, you know. Uh, Greg was talking about that kind of being a, an avoidance addict, you know. You know, maybe that will be uh, a new 12-step uh, group, uh, of Avoidance uh, Anonymous. <laughs> you know, in the end, you do start to get to a point where you go, I don't want to avoid anything. If, if Spirit's trying to show me how to be happy, I don't want to short-circuit that or delay that or push that away because I'm entitled to that happiness. That's who I am. I was created happy and I'm going to be happy. I'm not going to fight it anymore. I can't fight this feeling anymore. I've forgotten what I've started f fighting for. It's time to bring this ship into the shore and throw away the oars forever. Thank you, REO. You know, the songs are singing to us. The, the movies are reaching us. All the signs and symbols in time and space are being used by the Holy Spirit to say, it's time to wake up. You know, it's time to be happy. First be happy and then wake up to eternal happiness. But, but be a bringer of light. Be a bringer of, of the joy, of the happiness. Well, I have to say, one of the things that I enjoy the most about being with all of you, you you are our family. You are, as I look at the where you're all from, some of you are from the United States, but I'm looking at Australia, Brazil, Canada, Germany, Japan, Mexico, Netherlands, Norway, Peru, Sweden, Taiwan, UK. I mean, we have a big global family here that is in the tractor beam of light. I'll say that. And then I really, 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 really enjoy when you pour your hearts out and you write in questions. And I, I really enjoy it when you raise your hand and you participate in these big online global retreats because uh, it just touches my heart. I just feel when, whenever you're pouring your heart out and, and asking a question, I can just feel my heart cords going. Uh, I could feel my heart cords going, uh, you know, tuning in last night and, and uh, watching where, where uh, I think it was Angie was just in a, 
in a, a, a trailer park and she didn't even know. She just felt like she couldn't even formulate the question, but I could feel, Angie, I could feel your heart. I could feel your heart because, because there's something stirring inside of us that knows that there's something more than what we experience in this world. We know there's a lot more. We know we're just, we're tapping into something that's huge. We're tapping into the mothership of love and light. And we know that there, we cannot deny ourselves that love, that love is so important because it's who we are. It's, it's our very identity. And I can feel that in, in everything that you all share, you know, in, in the questions and the answers. I, was, I took some time to, to go through some of the questions and prayers that were written in for this online retreat. And um, yeah, I started to see, I mean, I could really feel your hearts. Holly writing in from Australia, you know, uh, I remember from the last time we met here online uh, how devastating that was uh, to go through an end of a relationship. The the loneliness, the the sadness, the frustration, the humiliation, the everything that was tied into that breakup of that relationship, and also with with your your ex-partner, there wasn't the communication, so it was like agreed that you wouldn't communicate. So, so there was that sense of um, like, wow, I want this, I need to heal, but it seems like communication is so much a part of the healing, and yet if that was part of the terms of the breakup, you know, it, that just adds another layer of frustration on to it. Instead of being able to talk it through or or cry, or just emote and go through that healing process, it seems like that, that's like another, like a restriction that's laid on there. And I was, as I was reading what you were had written too, it, it reminds me, that's why Jesus spends those nine chapters on special relationships, because, you know, as your life is going along there, you're working on your, your graduate studies, your doctorate, you're you're doing your travels, your adventures, and and I love those pictures, by the way, of all the places you would go and this and this, and it was so beautiful. But but also, that's what this unconscious is. There's this unconscious desire for love and form. Really, it's very very deep. It's oftentimes it's way out of awareness, and it's not until we we seem to have an opportunity that it starts to come come up almost like the Loch Ness monster you know it's uh it's just lurking under there it's a big slithering monster and it's okay when it's swimming because nobody sees it in the in the deep oceans but when when it comes to the surface and it rears its head it's just it's absolutely devastating but we do know that there's a it's part of the healing uh process too of, of bringing the darkness to the light and and allowing whatever is down there to to come up so that we hold no private thoughts so that we have no secret wishes that that we're not even allowing into awareness we have to become aware of that so as i was reading through what you had written you know it's like the way i think it works is that when you truly have a prayer in your heart for forgiveness and you truly want to heal <clears throat> you're really praying for a, just a huge, exceedingly happy experience that's so vast that anything in the mind that would block that, any shadow, any sliver of a thought or a belief uh, will have to come, have to come up. It's just, just the way that it works. And I know in my own life, that's the way it worked for me, where it just felt like, like, uh, how can, how do people function? How do people carry on? Um, it's like, it was such a deep, dark sadness and hurt. It was like dragging my mind down. And I was just thinking, yeah, it feels so bad. I don't even want to go out. I don't, 
I don't, and then I don't want to distract myself away from it either, but it's so intense. The, the feelings are so intense that it seems like that's, like the ego even tries to draw us into other things to get busy, get more busy with something else to try to distract our mind away from it. But this, this is the journey. This is why we're on the journey and this is why we're, we have these online retreats because we have to, we have to face these things. I do feel like, like you are aware that there's a need for letting the emotions up and letting the emotions pass through. So I think that was one of the things you wrote in, you were saying, because you happened to coincidentally uh, run into to your ex when you were out dining with a friend and that just seemed to trigger a whole more, another big wave of, of darkness that was, you know, you were kind of starting to deal with it a little bit and then that one kind of a chance meeting of, of, of chance encounters seem to just trigger it again. But I do feel like you're calling for some kind of circumstance where you can can start to let up some of these emotions and and at least begin to talk about them. Uh, because when they just are held in and, and there seems to be no opportunities to discuss them, or to move through them, uh, that's where the, the intensity, it just starts to get very, very dark. I've had a, a couple people, dear friends that have written to me recently, they've had suicidal thoughts. Another friend of mine um, uh, just had so much intensity that we were actually staying down in Brazil at, at this friend's house and then right after we left, the plumbing and the piping underneath the floors of his children's bedrooms uh, just exploded uh, up. First it was like a lump in the, in the floor, and then all of a sudden the pipes just exploded right after we left. You know, he was hosting us, we were there, we did a, a movie retreat on the weekend, and 70, 80 people showed up. Then we went off to the rural, uh, into the hills and the jungle, kind of not really the Amazon, but away a couple, an hour outside of uh, of Sao Paulo, and we had this deep, intimate gathering where a lot of the people had never even heard of a Course in Miracles. A lot of young people that were just searching, open, how can I heal? Eager, like sponges, to take in anything that would be helpful, and we did that very profound gathering and then as soon as we left there and we flew out then the the the, the plumbing the piping just exploded under the, the children's bedroom and and one of this uh, our host's main issues was around his children um divorced and 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 the ex and the children so it's like sometimes it plays out in extreme ways and all it is is extreme symbols showing us that whatever we were not acknowledging, whatever we were somehow hiding or we were keeping a bit under the surface, the circumstances have to be such that, that we take a look at it. It's part of our wake-up call. So it's like, I think, you know, your story and what you've written in is, is really for all of us to start to see that that the spirit will use relationships, but it will use them in a way to really have us face directly our beliefs in that we're somehow unworthy, that we're somehow lacking in something, that we're unfulfilled, that we're not enough. All those beliefs of the ego that the ego has told us is who we are, uh, those have to get exposed. And it was beautiful. You just it was you just laid everything out. But then when you were getting down to the bottom line, you were just saying it was the the feeling that you were thirty eight years old and and everything has gone wrong, and now you the ego projects that into the future, where it takes that feeling of of disconnection and and unfulfillment and and feeling of lack, and then it just projects it out and say, now you've got your whole life to live this out. 
this is just the darkness of the ego and its defense mechanisms. But so thank you for for exposing that and sharing that and and I will definitely we will hold that in prayer because I mean I honestly in my life and the way it's gone with the awakening is that I have come together with people whether I visited them or they visited me or we that's why we even have spiritual community it's almost like the community in some sense has been almost like a cocoon. Uh, and then you, just like the, the, the caterpillar that's got to break out of the cocoon and go th through the, the metamorphosis and the, the, to become the butterfly, there, we know that those creatures in cocoons oftentimes have to push their way out of the cocoon. The cocoon serves a purpose. The cocoon is just there for stability. It's there for nurturing. It's there for safety. It's there for support. And then ultimately nothing ends with the cocoon. That's just all very helpful. But then comes the willingness to start to push, push beyond the cocoon, to stretch beyond the cocoon, to really let the trust kick in in a very deep way where where you're just lifted higher and higher into higher states of mind that show you the, the real world, that take you to the real world. Also, uh, Seema, Seema, you wrote in, so as much as the intensity for Holly was around um, the loss of, of a partner, of a, of a relationship, and it just triggered everything, um, this Seema's, your angle has been more like with your mother and the frustrations and the, the control mechanism coming up. And, and you've been sharing on our, our recent online retreats for some time of all the things you went through with your father, with, uh, with his cancer diagnosis and all of the conditions. And, and it's almost like just that everything you went through with your father kind of cracked your mind open uh, and kind of drew forth more compassion than you had ever experienced and more warmth and more love that you were saying in, in what you wrote in that now with your father, it, it's not so much what his behaviors are. You know, when you go to a family get together or visit, you can, you can feel the patience. You know, the course says, you know, infinite patience yields immediate results. And, there's been like a healing, a cracking open with your father where you've been able to, to let go of so many expectations, even around your, your profession and, and being the caretaker and the, the medical profession and all the, the, you learned about the body and how the body functions, your heart just started to crack open. It's like, I love my dad and I, I, I want to share this love with my dad. And now, the spirit's like, good, good, good. You're moving in the right direction. Now let's bring in mom. <laughs> and, and, and now it's like, oh, no. Because the temptation then is to judge. Oh, I, what, I haven't made progress. And why, why am I so triggered by mom what, with her behaviors and, and, and her, even her uh, her service and devotion, but as long as our service and devotion is tied into the horizontal, um, then it triggers our own feelings of vulnerability around even service and devotion. Like, what am I serving? Is really it starts to really start to ask deeper questions. Like, what have I been serving? Uh, I've been putting so much devotion into this. It may have been the the family. It may have been like you said, um, fulfilling, uh, like I think our, our last uh, retreat, you were saying that even when you, the body of Sima was born, as the baby Sima came out, there was this, oh, the doctor has arrived. You know, you, you hadn't even, didn't even have med school or anything. It's like your whole future was scripted by, oh, the doctor is born, you know, and she will be a wonderful doctor and this and this. And how those expectations, those beliefs, are 
they, they project out a world where, where in some sense we seem to have our roles in life uh, very dictated. And they are dictated not, not by people, but it's dictated by our beliefs and by our thoughts. Like I always say, like a soul coming in with a backpack and the whole world is in the backpack, the whole cosmos, and you throw it out and then you seem to be stuck in the destiny of playing out whatever you threw out. One of the, the most powerful uh, scenes I've ever seen in a movie is the movie Tron, uh, where in Tron, Jeff Bridges plays this character where he's got a son, and, but the father is into technology and he, in, he invents a, a digital world and then he gets so drawn into it that he leaves his son and his family behind and he goes into this digital world and Clue in the digital world plays the ego. It's like it's still the one that's the gatekeeper of the world that, that tries to maintain this fake generated computer world. But at one point in the movie Tron, it's a very powerful scene his, his son, who feels his father has abandoned him, comes into the digital world to find his father, and he's getting ready to escape from the digital world, and Tron has, is trying to prevent him from doing that. And he just kind of kneels down, and he puts his hands down on the ground, and it's like he pulls back the projection of everything that he's done with this digital world. It's a very powerful scene of these hands hitting the ground and, the, and it's just like a big pulling back of all the circumstances, all the situations, all of the projection of time and space gets drawn back, including Clue, which allows his son to, to go free with this uh, ISO that's this uh, amazing uh, character and, and go up into this be tractor beam of light. I just remember I was, I was seeing it in Southern Australia when I first saw it and it was one of the most powerful forgiveness scenes that I'd ever seen in a motion picture because it, it actually showed that you have, to, you have to bring it back to your mind. You can't continue the blame game. You can't blame parents or circumstances or culture or upbringing. We can't blame politicians. We can't, we can't blame these characters because it was our mind's power that we gave to the ego to generate this false construct of time and space. And now we have to take it back. We have to reclaim the power. We have to realize it's, it's the power of our own decision. We are not at the mercy of, of this world in any way, shape, or form. So I thank you, Seema, for sharing that because it was a very different angle from Holly. Holly is, is it triggered the sadness and the, almost this uh, like unrequited love, like this, you have all this love to give, you think you're going to be able to give it in the context of a partnership and then everything goes askew and then with with you it's almost more with Seema like you're just being asked by the spirit to transfer the training now like whatever you just went through with your father now you're being asked to transfer that and and practice that with your mother um, because she what she's triggering is just these expectations and assumptions and beliefs that are still in the mind and that's why even her behavior can get on seem to get on your nerves and you can get very irritated and then the ego will say ah yeah yeah this this that's the way you feel and then and then at some point it explodes into you know it just comes out you just a harsh word a harsh look a harsh reaction to your mother and then then that starts, like you said, the cycle of, oh, what did I just do? And, and then you feel bad, you feel guilty, 
And then you loop around into this cycle of, okay, I, I've, got, I've, I've got to apologize, but, but then more than that, it's like this feeling, and now I've got to make it up. Like it's the guilt talking inside your mind. Like now you've got to go the extra mile to make up for what the ego says you've just done. It says, look, there's the evidence. You know, you, you were hurtful again, and it tries to recycle that into do something, do something to make up for it. And, and that's a very typical cycle. It's a defense mechanism where then people do all kinds of things to try to, to make up for the guilt. I always tell the story of my friend Lisa Fair, you know, when I first met her, that uh, she had gone from, from poverty and living on food stamps and, and a very difficult life. And then she got pregnant and then, and then her life turned. Uh, it was like a pretty woman with uh, Julia Roberts, you know, except she, she's a waitress in a, in a cafe, in comes the John Gear or the, the the Richard Gear character uh, to save the day, a millionaire, and then the millionaire doesn't just give a tip, a big tip to the waitress. He marries the waitress and takes her out of poverty, extreme poverty, and then suddenly she's married for, to a millionaire, from food stamps to a millionaire, and yet with her children, as the children grow up. She had so much guilt around parenting. You've talked about that with your, your son and the dynamics with that. She had so much there. She tried to overcompensate for the early years of how it could have been better. She could have been a better mother and done more things where she would just spoil her kids by giving, giving material things, material things. When I met her too, she said, oh yeah, everybody likes the Christmas party because I give wads of cash to my children and to all their friends. You better believe there's a big Christmas party. The children are growing, showing up to the party to get wads of cash. <laughs> Talk about an overcompensation for guilt. <laughs> Giving money, throwing money, money, money. That's of course, a very common thing in the world. Spoil, throw money, money, money. And then the more I talk with her about being intuitive, praying, joining with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, let your yay be yay, your nay be nay, really get into guidance. Let your life be led by, by guidance. Uh, one of the first things that happened was that Christmas came along and the, the children, all the children showed up, the friends and everything. Where's my, where's my cash? She said, no, I won't be giving out any cash. There, then you can see the rage of the, the ego, the expectation of Christmas and cash and everything. And it, that's just an extreme example about how we have to get in touch with these self-concept beliefs. And we have to even look at where we've been overcompensating to try to make up for guilt, because that may seem loving on the surface, but the motive underneath it is guilt. It's trying to make up for something that was believed to be real and, and disastrous in the past. And then, you know, we, that's where codependencies are, are, get reflected in the projected world is, is it all starts, it all starts in the mind. And then, um, so in here, uh, Kristen, Kristen Lorraine from Stanford, California. It was so beautiful because you were saying at the beginning um, that even when you start to make a prayer to the Holy Spirit, you have all this love and this gratitude, but you sometimes you have this feeling of um, the way that you're doing it or the way that you're writing is still has a feeling of, of not being right, like something's not enough. Like, like, okay, this is for God, this is for the Spirit, so I've got to really make, oh, is that the right word? Or whatever, too wordy, not pure enough, I think were some of the things. It's just a sense of, of lack. It's actually what you're describing is there's kind of this sense of unworthiness, like 
like to approach holiness, um, there's gratitude, but it's like the feeling is there should be more gratitude or I, I need to do it somehow better. And then just through the experience you had last night, it's so beautiful because um, first you had written a prayer where you were really opening and, and, and asking to be shown, how do I do this? And then I was so happy this morning because they come and they always bring in me the updates and, and you had written a poem and were, that was part of the undoing, I think, of the unworthiness was to share this beautiful poem that just came through you. And this is a perfect example of the healing process where you just write out and expose where there's doubt thoughts, where there's things that you're, you know, you're not sure about, like Andy was, was talking about, and the, the, Andy and Ken were talking about the exposing, the expression sessions. You just used the writing in as a beautiful expression session, and then this beautiful, clear, loving poem just came, trickled out so easily, without the coulda, woulda, shoulda, without the wanting to play around with it or edit it or whatever. It just sounds like it just flowed so beautifully. So I'm going to read the poem for everybody. Uh, and also, to me, it's always, I love the backstory behind it because it's this whole thing taken in a context is how we heal. We, we don't have to do it perfect in form. We don't, we have such perfectionistic tendencies that the ego does of, of wanting to get things right, wanting to, things to be perfect in form and do that right. And then once we expose some of our doubt thoughts, that's what Andy and Ken were talking about, that, that exposure, that's what the, the expression sessions are about, then it's like a fresh breeze comes in and we feel so open and so relaxed and we can just be. We, we, we lose our cares and concerns for how it looks. Uh, and, and to me, that's the most beautiful thing that it's like, it's like when we were children and children would come and they'd put a costume on us or, or play with us or mess our hair up or do certain things. And, and it was all in the spirit of play, you know? And then when the mask comes in of these expectations is somebody would come up and I don't have much hair to mess up, but if somebody would mess your hair up or something and you take it personally, it's that's the ego being offended at some form that it doesn't like. And it breaks the whole world into the acceptable and the unacceptable. And then it just goes that way. So I'm, since we're talking about the forgiven world, I'm going to read the poem that Kristen gave to us uh, from spirit as a gift for all of us. titled Forgiveness. To make of my mind an empty bowl and feel it filled with grace. To ask of your hand and joined with mine and reach toward heaven's gate. To move past the veil of a world of fear to be lifted up in peace so clear to wake in the love it's all stapled together here so I'm going to get the last verse to wake in the love we never left the song of God in our ear. Mm, that's sweet. So that is like a demonstration of, of what we're talking about to open to the forgiven world. And to the extent that we cannot make exceptions with that, sometimes people feel, well, I, can, I can't do this at my work situation because of this and this and this, or... 
with certain family members or with a partner or certain ones, that's where you really have to have the honesty to just notice if there's a little bit of a hold back or a little bit of a, I, I won't say that, uh, for fear of rocking the boat or fear of consequences. Yeah, that's a big one in this world. We feel like we, we have to hold certain things back and then the joy of of even being guided to a mighty companion or just a close friend and being able to just pour our heart out and just say whatever is there to be shared that is so healing because jesus tells us in the course that it's it's the thoughts that we want to protect or hide that hold us back from forgiveness so Coming to a discernment or an honesty just to start to look, oh, is there something I still am hiding, still holding back, that still is, is gnawing away at me, that still, I'm still struggling with. Those thoughts go around like a tumbler without exposing. Sometimes we have to start to realize that that's, that's the point where the forgiveness can occur is, is by not hiding and not protecting. That leads into um, what Stephanie wrote. Uh, because Stephanie is feeling all the gratitude and she's been practicing with handing the thoughts over. Um, and she's drawn to that, but, but Stephanie, you wrote, uh, lately I notice when I journal that I have a holdback. There have been a lot of things I shared with Holy Spirit, but there have been thoughts and feelings I didn't want to share. My pencil just stopped moving. But I heard the invitation to try it out. So I wrote very slowly, word by word, accompanied by tears. And I handed all over to the Holy Spirit. It felt like a ray of the sun was caressing my face. I got a deeper experience that I don't need to figure anything out or analyze. No private thoughts towards the Holy Spirit. I feel this deep trust like never before, and experiences of love miracles are guiding the way. So that's similar to what we just talked about with, with Kristen, where it's like really paying close attention where if there's any sense, even a slight sense of holdback, and, and this situation was what many of us have used journaling. So it's just, you don't even have a person there. You're just kind of watching very carefully. Where am I holding back? Where am I, do I still feel some, some shame or some doubt or even a sense of embarrassment or anything like that? And so here's the prayer that, that Stephanie included for all of us. I thank you, God, for the joy and laughter I experience. Holy Spirit, decide for me. Amen. With love. And so, as Andy was sharing last night, it, it's when you first start to look at even the metaphysics, there can be things where where the mind just puts it aside a bit like, well, I don't, I don't understand that at all. I don't know how that relates. But when you come to that honesty of just saying, I'm willing to trust and I'm willing to journal or to expose, just to drop the mask ever so slightly, then that is what ignites the healing process, it starts to take us much faster towards that, that beautiful forgiven world, just by our willingness 
to, to trust, to take a deep breath, to take a pause. And it's a, it's a way of the mind like reorienting, opening up. I think it's, it's actually so precious because, I mean, as I go through my day, uh, I just feel the prayers coming from all parts of the world and, and all my brothers and sisters. A lot of times, um, little text messages through the phone or uh, messenger, Facebook messenger, little an email here or there, there's little chat message here or there, but oftentimes it's just, it's just a prayer. And it's such an honor to be that safety, that, that warm, loving, non-judgmental presence that allows these things to come up. Even uh, last night, when I was awakened in the middle of the night and I went and just checked my phone and, and I received a, just one instant message, but it was about, oh, I just had these crazy, you know, suicidal thoughts go through my mind. It doesn't make any sense. And, and it's just this like lingering heaviness that, that something could go wrong, that something could go terribly wrong. And then there's this, like a little part of the mind that's just like, I don't know if I can handle that. I don't know if, if it's too intense. And so I always remember that Jesus teaches the lonely journey to God fails because it excludes the one that it would find. That we enter the ark of peace two by two. We are here for each other. It doesn't help us to try to go and handle this in a sense with a feeling of on our own or by ourselves that, that everything goes much faster when we can confide in somebody, when we can call somebody, we, we can write somebody. Uh, Helena, Helena Elias, you're here with us. That time you sent me that beautiful voicemail. It was like, it was like God writing to me. It was the spirit just, I could tell it was from the just the core, the core, the core of your heart. And you just put it out in, in, a, in a couple beautiful long uh, voice messages, which was fantastic because I was just every second of every one, it was just like so much love. And, and that's the thing. We do need to extend, when the Spirit puts it on our heart, to extend in however that we're supposed to do it. I think it was, you even did it with the video, I think, which was beautiful. And it was so beautiful because I could just hear it in your voice. I could see it in your face that we're so joined in this and, and we need to be joined in this because it's, it's not like the kind of uh, things that people talk about, about climbing Mount Everest or, or <laughs> overcoming some, a physical obstacle. This the ego is is not a physical obstacle. It it it's at the core of our mind. It's almost like we have this mind that's pure light, and then it seems to have been defiled by this this tiny mad idea. And and in order to really see past this speck, this tiny little mouse roaring at the universe, this this little speck of a belief, we. We need to join in that way, and we need to walk hand in hand because otherwise it seems too overwhelming. It seems seems like it's too big. Like uh, I remember years ago, uh, I saw a, cart a caricature that uh, the famous psychologist Abraham Maslow had drawn, and he was in the field of psychology. But in the field of psychology, there are so many theories, and there was Freud that came before him, and B.F. Skinner, and all these. There were some pretty dark, pessimistic uh, views of psychology and the human condition. And Abraham Maslow was this uh, psychologist who believed everybody was good at the core of their being. And he always tried to look for the good in all of his patients and 
he even built that hierarchy of needs, the basic needs below, and then at the very top of his pyramid was self-actualization. And he really believed that deep down, we are good. We are good at the core. And we need to practice loving as Jesus loved by really seeing the good in everyone that we meet. Not just some, but for everyone. It's like we need a vision that's so broad that we can overlook the behaviors. We can overlook those facial expressions. We can overlook that tone of voice. We can become so generous and so gracious and so into the goodness in our own hearts that we can, if somebody yells at us or screams at us or whatever, that we can feel that loving presence and we can just be so soft and say, what's going on? Is are you okay? Tell me about it. You know, we can, we can reach out and then all of a sudden the softness just comes in there because there's no attack, no defense, just easy. And I feel like it's, we, that's the most value of these online retreats is that even digitally, you know, it's amazing to get 80 some of us all in the same digital room. <laughs> We're all in, we can see each other's facial expressions. We can, we can hear the tone of voice. We can, we can feel that connection that we long for, that sense of intimacy of the mind that's so important for us. And in that, that I feel is the greatest thing of, of, of using technology for healing. The ego invented the whole world of time and space, and so the ego must be behind all the technology too, but, but Jesus and the Spirit can use whatever the ego made. And I just see that all of us joining all around the world in such an intimate way, this is such a glorious, holy use of technology. You know, I can feel the intimacy. I can see it in your faces as I'm talking. I, I, you have to forgive me if I don't look into the camera, but I, I, I'm like talking and looking into your faces as I'm talking. And, and, I'm, and that's just for me. I see the faces lighting up and that's how I feel. You're just witnessing my inner feeling. And, and now they're shifting around. It's so, there's so many of you, they have to shift. <laughs> they have to shift from screen to screen. I feel like I'm a little bit like Lucy, you know, uh, in the movie Lucy, uh, where she, she gets there, she has to go like this because there's so many, I see so many smiling faces that we have to shift to the next group. And then there's another group of smiling faces. And then there's another group because we can't, I don't have a big enough screen to fit all 80, some 85 of you or whatever on there. So why don't we, um, with the time we have remaining, I, why don't we, uh, Nicholas, just open it up, and uh, this is, for me, always, I just love to have these interactions, and then I have to say, I've heard the the wisp of the movie, uh, wow, the movie, we need a movie to carry us, and this movie this afternoon is uh, is going to do it. You know, there's an actor in the movie that actually I have such a fond spot because of his playfulness, his transparency, his uh, childlike spontaneity and glee. Uh, and I've seen it in a lot of different movies, but I'll just say uh, the, Bill Murray is going to be in our movie this afternoon. And uh, I, I like what comes through him. I like the way the Spirit uses him to open up all of our hearts to come back to that uh, humor and playfulness. So let's open it up, uh, Nicholas, with the time that we've got left here. Well, thank you, David. Yeah, we have uh, Regina who has her hand up. Go ahead, Regina. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I... Hmm. I'm new to this group. I'm new to the course. Um, I'm feeling such a transmission of peace from you, David. 
Um, but still in my life, I'm encountering a lot of fear. Um, I didn't sleep well last night after uh, the session. I woke up in fear. Um, I do try, when I notice the fear, to, to pray. But sometimes I just come right back to the fear. And um, I find it really hard when I'm in that fear to hear any kind of guidance. And um, I so want to follow guidance. Um, I was just laughing about being on the uh, wild goose chase. And I've been on a real wild goose chase in terms of degrees and academics and money. And I feel like I've succeed, succeeded in the, that, that world, this world, not the real world. Um, and I feel like there's got to be a connection between that and the fear. Um, and I've done a lot of work. I've, you know, I've done a lot of work. And yet the fear is still there. And I appreciate being with you now and being with everyone now and feeling peace. And I do touch in on peace. Um, and I recognize that this is a journey. Um, I remember listening to you and you saying, um, referring back to that song from Godspell, Day by Day, <laughs> and knowing that it's day by day. But still, sometimes in the middle of that fear, it just feels so crazy to me. And really what I want is to move towards the light and to know who I am and to know truth more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. I, yeah, I, what I hear you saying, too, is I can so relate to that because... Um, oftentimes the fear would be so intense and it would it would be so pervasive that I would be like like underwater trying to just get my head above water to get a breath. Uh, it it feels felt so heavy and so repressive and and then over the years um, music was helpful for me. Like, like when I I was up actually in the middle of last night too, but sometimes. Um, when I was going through it where I felt a heaviness of the fear, almost like I was like something had me by the neck and was holding me down or something and I couldn't escape. Um, spirit would sometimes start by bringing in just sometimes one song. I would just get a little prompt to play a certain song or whatever. And then that one song over the years exploded into like a symphony of songs um, that were reflections of hope. Uh, and I found out when I was 40 years old that my name Hoffmeister with the spelling and the master of hope it took me 40 years to figure that out. But, but before that, Jesus was sending me a lot of ropes of hope, the, the rays of light, little things that when I felt really down and out and disillusioned and scared, um, the slightest things. I was also very shy, so it takes a while for us to start to open up to um, to receive, even to receive uh, from from those that want to give to us. Uh, and 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 musically, I mean, Alanis Morissette, you know, she's got had some great songs about "Thank You for Your Most Generous Triggers" and some. Some of these artists, they you can tell they're they've been in the fear too, and they they found those little ropes and those little rays of light, and then they put it into a song, um, and a lot of Beatles songs, John Lennon songs. I mean, it, it, there's so much available that's that's there as helping hands for us, but but it does take that just that willingness for us to stay willing and open to, and stay in that. Show me, please show the way. And even one of those uh, John Lennon songs, you know, whatever gets you through the night, it's all right. It's all right. Do it wrong or do it right. It's all right. You know, I mean, those are the kind of songs that it would give me a, just help loosen the fear just a little bit um, because I could feel the love coming through that. I knew that John had, had 
gone through that and he was writing straight from his direct experiences and and just letting it be shared in music uh, all over the world and and that's inspired me to to do that too so i do for many years i just have felt to put so much stuff on the internet and and share so much stuff freely because i know how it felt when i felt i was really pressed down by that fear and i needed help so thank you for, for bringing that up for all of us, because uh, I know people are feeling that. And, and, and it's, I would say it's really our fear of redemption. You know, we're afraid of correction, divine light. We're afraid of, of pure innocence. You know, the ego cannot stand the idea of pure innocence. It's so convinced of guilt. It's, it thinks it's, pure innocence is ridiculous. And yet... We're also afraid of it because of our identification with the ego. When we do have these loving experiences, we have these, I call them ego backlashes and ego whiplashes that the more loving and the more expansive the experience, the more intense the backlash can be. And so it, it makes a real predicament for us. Uh, so we're just so joined together, Regina, and, and I'm so glad that even though you're just beginning with the course and, and this, that you really took the courage to uh to come and just share that for all of us because you know it's a it's a huge blessing for everybody to see see you witnessing to that thank you mm -hmm. well we have uh just a few minutes david do you want uh, one more yes yes okay uh, we have Cecilia who has her hand up. Go ahead, Cecilia. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention two things. Um, a couple of days ago, I was thinking um, there is a Unity Church in here, and there is another another uh, Miracle Church, and I was thinking. I said. I should I should ask them to invite David to Reno. And then I saw David posting about being in Nevada on Facebook. And I thought, um, Nevada, where? And today when, David, you mentioned that you were in Reno, I was just shocked because I was like, oh, my God, I think I'm calling him, you know, to come to Reno. And, uh, in a star group here or do something, uh, I was just shocked. I was like, thanks spirit. Something good is happening here. And the other uh, thing I want to mention is that when I was um, very young, I used to write a lot. I love to write, but I was writing my journal and my, my dad and my mom um, picked it up. I fall asleep and my parents picked it up and read it. And then I got in trouble for everything where I work. And I didn't write anymore. I was like, oh, hell no. I'm not going to write and I'm not going to tell them anything about my writing. And then um, when I wrote my dissertation, it was very hard for me to write until my, um, one of my uh, guides told me that I was very bad. My writing was very poor that I didn't deserve to be in a doctoral class, et cetera, et cetera. And then I thought, okay, just watch me. And then I wrote the dissertation and I block again. I can't write. Then when I, when I watched one of your videos and you mentioned, David, that uh, journaling could help, I thought, I know I still don't feel comfortable. Then what I did was, when I feel that feeling that it bothers me, that it makes me feel uncomfortable, worthless, or hesitated, doubtful, whatever, sad, I grab the feeling, and then I watch your videos. Yeah, I think I watched five to six videos, if they're short, a day. And if they're long, you know, two or three during the day, that's the way I, um, I've been able to heal 
little by little because of your videos. I don't have, I feel I don't have to, um, I don't have to write. I just think about it, grab the feeling. And if at that very moment I can't uh, heal or go watch a video, I just you know, uh, re remember the feeling, or write it down, or whatever. And then, and I just want to thank you uh, for all those free videos, for all that information. I still have like 13 of your books to read. But I will someday, <laughs> little by little. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. Yeah, you have a very powerful mind because you, uh, Jeffrey, and I were just there in Reno and um, and actually looking at, at a possible com community house right there, uh, right there in the area, right where you are, and um, also as a like a launch base. Um, uh, to launch up, up and down the coast, all the way up there with you, Helena, Elias, and Vancouver, Vancouver Island, all the way down through uh, the Bay Area, and uh, of course Sacramento, Fresno, down to Los Angeles, San Diego. We have we have a friend of ours, uh, Olivia, who has uh, five course groups in between um, Tijuana and uh, San Diego. So it feels like that's just an, another calling of extending with our beloved ones out uh, all along the West Coast. And the funny thing was, um, uh, we, we really hung with it because uh, there was so much like snow, ice, uh, fog, to the to get up to get the plane off the ground uh, and then when we got there to Reno it's the first time I've happened I looked down it was a blanket of white clouds they were saying it was fog but it just blanketed the whole area and uh, so we just circled around Reno we were just flying around in circles around and around and around and then they finally said uh, we need some wind or some sun no, we sort of circled around and around. Finally, we're going to Sacramento, so we ended up going all the way to Sacramento, and then prayed, got guidance to uh, shift the rental car. We drove that beautiful road off of 80, 80 back over there. We came in under the clouds, <laughs> under the fog, uh, that way, and then we could tell it was all the spirits plan though, because there was a big bright yellow airplane in Sacramento that had spirit on it so we were getting signs and symbols just enjoying the adventure but that's the first time i've ever uh had to come to a city like underneath the fog because the plane couldn't even land so your powerful mind uh drew us in there and i heard that you're you might even be aside from the books you might even be doing our mmt mystical mind training and uh that's that'll That'll blow the ego out of the water for sure. That is, that's strong stuff. That's strong stuff. But we're with you all the way. And, and I hope uh, now that I know that you're there, we'll, uh, we'll make contact uh, next time. We're, we're over in that part. We get to Reno again. So thank you. And thank you all for, for joining in today. I have I always had such a great time. And, feel such love and connection and it's I th am just always in a, a miraculous state of mind that we can come together and support each other uh, in this way where the bodies seem to be all over the world but our one mind is is waking up in a very rapid way and we're, we can take whatever uh, whatever comes our way we are going to uh, rise above into the forgiven world so have a good little break and then uh, I'll see you back here with uh, Bill Murray, and uh, let's let's have some laughter to, uh, in our awakening uh, this afternoon. God bless.